bring this sort of a notion of outdoor, even if you're working 50 stories up uh, uh, in the city. A sort of last, um, oh yeah, so, so the spiral, which is breaking ground in, uh, in July, is, is roughly 250,000 square meters. Google approached us uh, a few years ago, um, and the first building we're building for them is exactly the same scale, uh, but in a completely different environment. And, and Google has become sort of interesting in, uh, in the new economy because somehow Google with its interiors, with the sort of colorful, playful, active, and, and sort of healthy snack bars, uh, it became um, sort of the standard of Silicon Valley. Um, and they, they approached us three, four years ago because they wanted to somehow reimagine. Uh, they never built a building either. They always inhabited the existing spaces. So we started looking at the organization architecture of Google. Uh, the studios are organized into teams of up to 25 people. Teams bundle into neighborhoods of up to 100, 150 people. They constitute a community of up to 500 people. And, uh, and the first building we're, we're building for them is, uh, uh, is 3,000 uh, people that we've sort of called a town. So typically you have all the support functions, the labs, the meeting rooms, the snack kitchens, the, the support spaces sort of cluttering and breaking up the continuity. So we thought, what if we separated on two different layers, one for focused work, then each uh, neighborhood size, 150 people, is organized into a platform. All the platforms connect, but they leave space between them for what we call parks or plazas, um, where you have all of the social spaces, the meeting rooms, the, the labs, the, the restrooms. Um, so everything is always connected just with one uh, 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 level. Then you have a single canopy that's actually entirely made out of photovoltaics. So it harvests all the uh, photons and turns them into electricity, except the ones that are needed to have a perfectly lit uh, uh, indoor environment. So here you see the, the basic building. It's, so it's uh, the, the tensile structure, uh, entirely clad in photovoltaics. The, um, the canopy extends out to create covered spaces uh, outside and also shading the, the facades. Um, then you can sort of move in. And actually, there's a public passage going through uh, the entire complex. So even if you're not a Googler, you can actually use the cafe. So Google becomes more urban than maybe it is to, today. And, uh, and then you have the plazas, the, the courtyards, that are sort of identifying elements, just like when you walk around in the medieval city of Barcelona, you can sort of recognize Plaza del Pi and Plaza Neri. They become like uh, points of reference. Um, and then you have like this vast open space flooded in, uh, in daylight. Um, and, and each of the platforms, the idea is that each team can then have their own um, almost like human scale architecture uh, made out of furniture and space defining elements so that you actually have a potentially a very diverse environment and where you can really see what it is people are, are working with. Google then uh, invited us to, um, uh, to look at applying the same thinking to London. So at King's Cross, uh, we're doing a 100,000 square meter uh, uh, office, but of course in a very, very different uh, context. So uh, it's right next to the, uh, uh, where the, uh, the, tr the train arrives from, uh, from Europe. Um, and here, because we are in a completely different context, we almost took the, the diagram and turned it upside down. So we have extremely tall uh, ceilings, so we can get daylight all the way through the deep floor plates, and then all the support functions are actually hung under the ceiling, because what, de what defines how much daylight you can have is how tall uh, the window is. In this case, the window is 12 meters, um, almost like our, our office in, uh, in Copenhagen. And then, of course, like instead of having the green outside, of course, here the green is, uh, is on top. That brings me to the sort of last um, series of ideas that, that I'd like to share. Like, we call it social infrastructure. And everybody knows that infrastructure can often have a negative uh, impact. For instance, like where a bridge crosses over uh, a neighborhood. This is Granville Bridge in Vancouver, uh, the trifork of the bridge has left this entire area sort of as a, as a leftover space, even though it's in the middle of, uh, of downtown Vancouver. So we were asked if we could try to see if we could turn this into a positive. Um, so we started mapping 
all the constraints. You have setbacks from the bridges. You have, set, you have one setback because the city wants to secure that nobody looks straight into the traffic on the bridge. So you have a 30 meter setback. Then we have a park where we're not supposed to cast shadows. And we're left with uh, a tiny footprint, uh, 600 square meters, almost too small to build. Let me thought, if 30 meters setback is a minimum distance, once we get 30 meters up in the air, we can expand the floor plate. So when you drive over the bridge, uh, it's almost as if someone is pulling a curtain aside. Uh, welcome to Vancouver. Or it's almost like a, a, a weed growing through the cracks in the pavement and blossoming as it gets daylight and air. If you compare it to the flat, the flat iron is the child of, of basically Broadway and the grid of Manhattan, creating this sort of striking landmark. We're just taking the flat iron idea like one step, uh, one step further. And underneath, uh, you can have shops and offices and, uh, uh, and restaurants. We're trying to turn the underside of the bridge into a positive. So we're working with uh, Rodney Graham and a series of Vancouver artists to create this sort of Sistine's Chapel of street art, a place where you look up uh, and the underside suddenly becomes uh, a positive. In, in a way, you can say the whole project is about turning the negative impact of the bridge into uh, an asset. Um, it's, it's under construction right now. And finally, also, like when, when a piece of infrastructure gets decommissioned, it can transform. Uh, next to Hamlet's Castle, Kronborg in, uh, in Copenhagen, we uh, transformed a decommissioned dry dock where they used to build ships into a uh, museum of, uh, of, uh, of shipping. Um, so uh, the museum is actually, in a way, preserving uh, the dock. Three bridges, one stops the water from coming in, one connects to the castle, and one gently slopes down, becoming the access into, uh, into the museum. So, so not only does the museum sort of help preserve the, the heritage uh, of the industry, um, uh, the different bridges like makes the, the city function. One of them serves as an auditorium, um, one of them as the, as the, as the canteen. Uh, but it also creates a new cultural space, not just inside uh, the museum, but also the, the, court, uh, the, um, the dock itself has amazing acoustics because you have uh, hard walls and open ceiling. You actually it's an amazing uh, outdoor performance space. And it creates this sort of coexistence between the UNESCO World Heritage uh, and this sort of new uh, environment. This is this sort of inverse Titanic moment. But then also, I think one of the things that makes social infrastructure really interesting is that not just can you reinvent the negative impact of a bridge and turn it into a canopy or transform a, a decommissioned uh, dry dock into a, a museum. But with the clean technology, with the environmentally progressive technology, the negative side effects of, for instance, a power plant doesn't have to uh, exist anymore. So we're designing a power plant in Copenhagen, opening this year, that basically turns waste into electricity and district heating. It's going to be the tallest and biggest building in Copenhagen. It's going to replace the power plant you see on this photo. It's in the port, so it's right next to the Copenhagen Cable Park, where the locals go water skiing. So um, we thought, how could we make this an asset to the community? And, and Danes actually love to ski. We have, uh, we have snow, but we have absolutely no mountains. But apparently we have mountains of, uh, of garbage. So uh, we have to go six hours by car to the south of Sweden to, to ski, alpine skiing. We can do two-thirds uh, of that ski slope on the roof of the power plant um, simply because it is so, uh, so big. So uh, we proposed this in a competition. Miraculously, we won the competition uh, based on that proposal. It's also going to be a, a hiking path. You can sort of enjoy the views uh, of the otherwise horizontal city of Copenhagen. It, has the, it will have the tallest climbing wall in the world, 100 meters. Um, and it comes very close to realizing this notion of of man-made ecosystems, uh, because it, not only does it you know, capture all the rainwater for the roof park, uh, it also uh, forms, like let's say, um, uh, uh, a metabolism that the waste from the citizens actually comes back as energy. 
Um, this is what it looks like uh, right now. It's, it's, almost, it's almost finished. Uh, the park is going to be skiable in the, in the fall. Um, but it's essentially... <clears throat> The, the reason that it makes sense is that because it allows us to completely change our preconceived notion of what is a power plant because a clean power plant doesn't have to be sort of a hostile uh, thing. It can actually be, uh, the, it will be probably the most popular park in, in Copenhagen because you can do so many things you can't do in, in the flat parks. Um, so in that sense, like progressive environmental technology is not just morally superior, it, it actually has much more social and environmental benefits uh, for, the, for the people inhabiting the city. I think as the largest sort of implementation of this idea of social infrastructure is a project we're breaking ground on uh, in, the, um, in the late spring in New York. Because uh, right when I moved to New York, like two years later, Hurric Hurricane Sandy came and wiped out um, most of, uh, uh, of the city from uh, 34th Street and down. It gave rise to a new neighborhood, according to uh, the New Yorker, SOPO. Um, so we were invited by the Obama Sand Recovery Fund to see if we could create or imagine the necessary resiliency infrastructure in a way that wouldn't be a seawall segregating the life of the city from the water around it. Uh, and inspired by the High Line, we thought the High Line is train tracks turned into social and environmental programs. What if we don't have to wait for the resiliency infrastructure to get decommissioned before it becomes nice? What if we can actually design it so it comes with positive, premeditated social and environmental side effects? Um, so we actually created um, a, uh, a method that we presented to the city of New York where we said, we're going to reach out to the local uh, community uh, and we're going to... Um, uh, make all of the necessary uh, flood protection, but we're going to do it in dialogue with representatives of the different uh, neighborhoods. And with them, we're going to co-design something that solves the flooding, but also makes their access to the waterfront better and, and creates the, the neighborhood that they want to live in. So I'd like to show you a, a, a film um, that we've made uh, together with uh, Squint Opera. Jan Bunge, their CEO, is also here today, a good friend of mine. Uh, um, where you can see some of the people we work with, you can hear their experience of, of Sandy, and, um, and you can hear their concerns and their dreams about the future of, of, their, uh, of their waterfront and, and, and what, it, uh, what it's going to look like. That was actually why Sandy was so bad. Is I Can you hear?
essence of how it can become into the natural landscape itself, uh, how we want to program that is, uh, is, is, is really the next challenge. So, um, yeah, so the dry line, we, we are, we're actually uh, breaking ground on the entire east portion and we're currently working on the entire uh, sort of southern tip, including uh, Battery Park C. Um, but, but maybe sort of our, our, our biggest sort of uh, implementation of a social, uh, social infrastructure. Um, so all, all of these things have somehow pointed um, towards this idea that at, as as society changes and as, as climate changes and as technology changes, uh, new possibilities arise. And we've, since I moved to, uh, uh, to New York and since we've been working with, uh, with Google, we've, we've been starting to work with um, uh, some companies that really deal with trying to imagine the future. And, and we got invited by, by Hyperloop to look at the future uh, of transportation. And just, you know, you look at sort of the, the, the evolution of, um, uh, of, uh, of different forms of transportation, the Hyperloop, in a way, can, can bring the, the cargo carrying capacity that you see in shipping because it can move incredible volumes at, at very, very low uh, uh, energy expen expenditure. It can move faster than, uh, uh, than air, uh, faster than a, a typical sort of a, a commercial jet. Um, it can be sort of a, it can have the sort of a, the re reliability, it, it won't be in any way affected by, by weather that you, uh, uh, you get from trains. And finally, it, it can have the sort of on-demand flexibility of, uh, of, a personal, of a personal car. Um, so if you sort of look at the sort of uh, development and speed, uh, uh, the Hyperloop will be sort of faster than a typical uh, commercial jet. It will be incredibly uh, safe because there won't be anything that can actually be on the, uh, on, on the tracks. It'll be uh, incredibly cheap. It's the most energy elegant uh, and efficient uh, solution uh, out there. It can go from sensor to sensor and, and move on demand uh, and, and can be sort of powered entirely with, uh, uh, with sustain sustainable el uh, energy. And because it can be done with tunneling or with a very small footprint in the right of way, uh, it, it can be implemented in a non-disruptive way in, uh, uh, in existing cities. Um, so yeah, the, the idea was seeded by Elon Musk in a white paper in uh, 2013. Uh, and since then, we've been working with Hyperloop One. Uh, it has uh, functioning uh, prototypes in, in the Nevada desert. BMW has helped uh, uh, create uh, an interior. And we've been working uh, with Hyperloop to look at the urban imp implementation, what what's going to be the user experience. And, uh, and we got um, commissioned by Hyperloop and uh, the Dubai Future Foundation to look at making a connection between Dubai and Abu Dhabi. It makes a lot of sense. They don't have an existing uh, train connection. Also, it has uh, very little, um, it moves mostly through desert, so it's, it's quite, it's much easier to do it than in a European setting. It actually goes through like um, very simple uh, uh, geological uh, uh, foundation settings and, and a lot of it can actually be an above ground tunnel in, uh, uh, in the desert, basically uh, uh, looking like this. Um, and, and what it does, it actually allows you to almost hyper jump at sort of extreme speeds from the, from the two furthest extremes. Uh, you can move in, uh, in 11 minutes, but basically from uh, Abu Dhabi airport to Al Maktoum airport, it's only uh, six minutes. So it is like by an order of magnitude faster than the fastest uh, alternative right now. Like the, the fastest right now would be to fly, but then you need to check in in advance. They're working on... Uh, a projected train system that doesn't exist yet, but this, this would really be almost like an instant uh, commute. And the basic idea is to make this sort of a, a, a part 
that can be organized in, in different ways depending on uh, on the passengers. But but whenever you're sending off, um, so so there's a certain capacity per 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 element that that shoots through the the hyperloop tube, and you can load it up with elements for passengers, and then you can put the the remaining uh, capacity. You can load it up with uh, with goods, uh, and then send it through the through the tube. Um, we're looking at different ways of, of designing uh, uh, those parts, but essentially that there will never be any, any wasted capacity. And the idea is that you don't have to load up an entire train um, uh, because you can send it off uh, on demand because it's propelled by the, the rails. Um, so also when you look at the, the user experience, we try to sort of analyze the quality of different user experiences based on orientation, convenience, immediacy and, and on demand. And of course, like airports are like quite confusing. You have to arrive like a, a lot of time in, uh, in advance. So it's, it's not very uh, uh, immediate. Um, the, the closest thing to immediacy is maybe the, the taxi, but it's not very fast. Uh, you can be stuck in a traffic jam. Uh, the elevator lobby is maybe the closest thing to, uh, uh, to, to what we're trying to look for. So the idea is that it, it comes with an app. So you already, uh, know uh, uh, which, which Hyperloop you're taking. When you arrive at the station, the station already knows where you're going because of the uh, RFID tag on your, on your phone. Uh, and it's sort of just like an elevator blinks. It tells you where to, uh, to go. So, so the logic is that you, in a way, you want to bring people in and out as, as effectively as, as possible. So, uh, and, and since it, it's about getting in and out of the, uh, of the, of the vacuum tube, that carries the, the Hyperloop, um, we've sort of designed it like a, like a noose or like a, like a loop, basically where you have the, the incoming traffic and the outcoming traffic uh, uh, in a very simple distinction between uh, passengers and, uh, uh, and Hyperloops. And in our, our Dubai and Abu Dhabi, we designed uh, two different station experiences, uh, one at the Etihad Towers that also becomes a connector across the major highways that they've built all over uh, the region, so uh, it really becomes a, a, a connective element um, between the, the different uh, uh, the different uh, developments. And then at the, at the base of, of the Burj Khalifa, um, you have like a rather large capacity coming in, and we've tried to sort of uh, sp split it out almost as a fan, so that as you arrive to the station, uh, the entire Every single uh, departure point reveals itself uh, visually, so you can imagine as you uh, as you enter into it um, from a single uh, from a single arrival point from the lobby, you can actually see <coughs> every single departure pod. So as you go in uh, and it sees who you are, it'll like light up, so you can instantly find out where, where it is you go uh, in order to get to uh, uh, to your destination. Um, So this is the one in, uh, uh, in Dubai, and, and so we, the idea is that this should be the beginning of actually creating an, an interconnected network uh, throughout uh, uh, the entire region. Um, just to give you a sense, again with Jan, we've made this film that sort of shows you the experience of how this can be radically different from uh, the, the, the typical sort of public transportation experience that, uh, that you know today.